Discovery Plus is the ultimate open house. It's the place to experience all your favorite real estate shows. Perfect. Stream what you love. Discovery Plus, available now. When Billy advises her patient against a risky surgery. Even if you make it through, you could die. The family forces her hand. If you want to operate, well, we'll find someone who will. And the outcome could be deadly for patient and doctor. Ah! You killed her mother? Now we're going to kill you. <laughs> the Resident, all new Tuesday at 8 on Fox. A stranger in the neighborhood wants to buy Calvin's business. My shop is not for sale. So you told him no. You don't say no to an offer this great. So you told him yes. What part of not for sale do you not understand? <laughs> the Neighborhood, all new episode Monday on CBS. The Hell's Kitchen chefs go head to head at a carnival. Going on rides, eating carnival food. This is going to be such a good time. But Gordon's games put the carnage in the carny kitchen, and everyone is fair game. This is f embarrassing. Get a grip or get out. Hell's Kitchen Battle of the Ages. All new episode Thursday at 8 on Fox. This February, guess who's coming back to the shore? Hello? Is this thing on? Beach, please. It's Snooki in an all-new special, Beach Cabana Royale. I'm terrified. It's a safe tool. <laughs> this is the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell, reporting from the nation's capital. All right. Um, the reel that you just heard, um, I really don't have to tell you who he is because they said his name like 50 <laughs> times. But um, he is someone that I consider... Uh, you know, there are a lot of people in this industry that you could look up to. Um, and he is one of those ones that uh, from from top to bottom, you know, he, he's he's good people. He's just good people. And I thought who would be better to start off uh, the legend series? Uh, if you don't know, I'm doing a seven part series where we're talking to legends of the industry, uh, folks who have been doing it and doing it well for a long time. And, um, you know, my, my next guest has been doing it so well for so long. I, 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 if I can get a piece of that in my little, you know, <laughs> career, I think I do. Okay. I have Mr. Joe Cipriano on the show, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Yes. Hey, you know what? I think you're doing okay too, Trey. <laughs> I keep the lights on. How about that? Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, it's how funny. Are you, sir? I am good. When you just said how long I, I how long is my, I think about that. My first promo I ever did was 40 network promo was 42 wow. years ago. 1982. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Uh, that is uh wow. And I think so it was my first network promo. It was for the Bugs Bunny and Tweety show on <laughs> ABC Saturday mornings. And my first movie trailer was also 42 years ago, 1982. For Fast Times at Ridgemont High. <laughs> you are correct, sir. You're correct, sir. You are correct, sir. <laughs> and I know that because um, one of the things I used to do before I became in the industry myself, I used to look at commercials, promos, and trailers, trying to figure out what the trends were then to now. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I found that trailer and I had the, the, the DVD and I found the trailer. Wow. And I'm like, why do I know that voice? It's totally different from stuff you've done, but still, when you know a voice, you know, and I'm like, is that Joe? Yeah. <laughs> and did some digging and found, I'm like, oh, wow. Because everyone, you know, in the industry knows you for this, for these high energy upbeat reads. Right. And that was like the total opposite of, of what you do. Um, but before we even get into the the after of the VO, because everyone knows, you know, who you are and and the stuff you've done, uh, mm -hmm. you pick a pick a it's like pick a card, pick a network, any network, you've heard Joe's voice on it. <laughs> Let's go back. Let's go back to a Joe with long flowing hair <laughs> who was just getting his start, uh, going to school at the school of broadcasting you know before joe was gracing us on the airwaves of tv he was uh embarking on a radio mm -hmm. career so yeah talk about how um things started for you as a as a young buck doing radio yeah uh, well i i knew as a kid uh i we had a school trip 
Uh, we went to WTIC in Hartford. I grew up in Connecticut. And I, I think I at, was about 10 years old. And when I saw the television studio and especially then the radio studio, I said, this is what I want to do, you know. And so it, I always knew I wanted to do something w involved with TV. And I thought that radio would be the stepping stone because, you know, all those those old timers, you know, Bob Hope and, you know, all those guys, they all came out of radio, you know, and then into film and then uh, in television. So, yeah. So I um, really started. I built a little radio station when I was about 12 years old in my bedroom. Used to broadcast oh, wow. live. Uh, when I was 14, I called a, a local disc jockey and said, I, I want to do this some someday. And can I come down and see the, what what a radio station looks like? And he invited me down. And that was I, you know, for two years, I would go down every weekend in the summertime. I would go several times a week. And eventually, when I turned 16, I got hired. So um, so that was my schooling. I never went to a broadcast school, you know, so I, I just hung around. Was that was that an internship or an actual, hey, kid, you're hired kind of job? Uh, the job at 16 was a real job. Wow. The, hanging around from 14 till then was not an internship. It was um, flying uh, under radar. Uh, even the uh, the the managers didn't know that I was there. They didn't want anybody hanging around the radio station. I'm sure. Just, you know, for uh, risks, you know, for if, if I were to get hurt or something like that, I mean, anything yeah. could happen. Um, so, yeah, the, all the disc jockeys used to hide me when the managers would come in. <laughs> I had all different places. One was in the FM studio. I was pretty small. I was 14. And I could yeah. go under the turntable. The door, there used to be a door that would go under this box. And I'd go in, in there and, and I'd sit in there and wait for the manager to That's leave. Wow. Yeah. But then I got hired at the radio station. It was owned by Merv Griffin. And huh. uh, uh, my first job was Sunday nights, nine till midnight. Um, and uh, I think I was paid a, a dollar 25 an hour. I think that's what it for a three hour shift. So I was pulling in the change. <laughs> Literally. That's pretty Literally. cool. Um, <laughs> I could imagine uh, being the, the youngster um, around all these grownups at this radio station. Um, were they very welcoming to you? Were they kind of like, like, what's he doing here? Like, what was the relationship um, with you and the other jocks? I, I was, yeah, I was very tight with uh, a couple of them. Uh, the guys that work on Saturday night, uh, Tim Clark and Ron Gregory. Uh, Ron was on the FM. Tim was on the AM. And they just took to me. I think both of them also started uh, similarly, you know, in hanging around mm -hmm. a radio station. And I think they looked at it as paying paying it back. And there's also, I mentioned this in my book, and you probably know this story already. This was 1970, 1969, 70. I, I grew up in suburban, uh, rural, let's call it rural Connecticut. There were no black people who went to school where, where, where I went. And so it was a, it was a shel sheltered kind of life. But the cool thing about Tim and Ron was Ron was a black guy and Tim was a white guy. And it, it showed me that, um, that I don't see color. Um, and, but it was amazing to then see that they were such good friends. They remain mm -hmm. best friends to today. And we're talking 1969 to, you know, to now. So yeah. um, it was an amazing thing for me. It, it opened my eyes. Um, and then, of course, when I when I finally left, um, you know, Connecticut and went to the big city, uh, it, you know, I went to Washington, D.C., which was such a diverse city. And it was and it was wonderful. But that was it was just something that just struck me there uh, as a as a 14 year old kid um, that these guys were just best friends. And it was something that I always looked up to. And I thought, wow, that's, that's awesome. Color doesn't matter. Uh, 
race doesn't matter. Um, religion doesn't matter, you know, all of that. Yeah, I think that's that's good for, for you to, to touch on because <clears throat> I know that um, for a lot of people, it's it's usually either or, mm -hmm. but if you can, you know, find common ground with anyone, yeah, um, it doesn't matter what you look like, but just treat me as a person. Exactly. Um, exactly. And if, if if we can get there, then we can move on to to other things. Yeah. Um, speaking of, you know, being in D.C., like you said, is a very diverse um, city. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a I, I would say you you and you being in dc is like how i felt um in certain uh rural parts of the country where <laughs> yeah. i may have been the minority so mm -hmm. how is it now that you're in dc i mean it's called the chocolate city mm -hmm. uh yeah what was that like being on the air there where in in all intents and purposes you were the minority now oh yeah <laughs> that's it's so true and i was working at a radio station uh, it was NBC. Now, again, now that we're talking about 1975, the program directors, the the managers of the station would never admit to it. We were a disco station. We were the first 24-hour disco station. Wow. Uh, and so our listenership was uh, at least 80% uh, black. Uh, mm -hmm. And and but they, at that time they, they didn't they didn't want to say that that for whatever reason, I, you know, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, so here I am, uh, I guess you could look at it that I'm a min minority, but the majority, uh, is listening to me on the radio and, and they knew, they knew me and, and knew my name. And it was whenever I would do live appearances and go out and do, you know, club dates and, and be a, a, a DJ at, at a disco or, or sure. wherever. Um, it was always, you know, that's, that was our audience. And again, it was, it was just so great for me. I mean, it was a wonderful way to understand that everybody's the same, you know? And again, it sounds weird to say this now, Trey, because, you know, but this was back then, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the late sixties and seventies. And I, I felt that I was kind of a, a head of the curve. In, in that way and thinking that way. So I love DC. Oh my God. I love DC. And thankfully I have a radio station that I image there. So I, my voice is still on the air and radio in DC. Oh, that's cool. For a radio yeah, I, I lived there, um, for the better part of, of eight years, uh, in the, in the nineties. Um, yeah. what, what station are you on up there? I was on WKYS. Ah, yeah, I'm sure yes. you know KYS, and I indeed I do with <laughs> the one and only uh, Donnie Simpson. Yeah, uh, and Donnie, uh, he came in. I got hired. Um, Eddie Edwards was doing afternoons. He left to go. I can't remember where he went, Pittsburgh or something. And they brought in Donnie from Detroit, and yep. he and I, uh, he followed me every day. So Donnie and I were were really good friends. We still we still talk, and if any of your viewers don't know Donnie Simpson. Oh my God. He is, he's, he is DC or was DC for forever. Uh, yeah, he, he was a, yeah. uh, an anchor at uh, BET. He, uh, music shows, uh, mm -hmm. incredible. When he came to town, he had no idea where to go. And I said, well, I live out in Wheaton, Maryland. Come on out <laughs> take a look at my apartment. And he and his wife, uh, lived in the same apartment complex long after I had left and, and, you know, and, and moved on and actually went to, um, LA. Uh, but yeah, he stayed there for, for a long time. He was a good, good guy. So yeah, yeah WKYS. He, and, and then after that, cool. uh, Q107, which was a top 40 station. Top, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Donnie is legendary still to this day. He was just oh. inducted into the radio hall of fame. That's right. Um, yeah. and, um, he did his, well, we think, Again, because he said it before, his final broadcast on air. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one thing about, and I know we talking about Donnie, but one thing about being in on, on the radio, and I talk to a lot of ex-jocks, every now and then you, you, you miss it. Um, do, do you ever have that inkling that I know with what you're doing now, 
<laughs> it may not be time wise possible, but do you ever get that itch to just let me just sit in and, and do a session and do yes, some, some yeah. old classic stuff? Do yeah, you? it's hard to to get the radio person <laughs> out of radio, you know. And um, I, I also Trey believe that uh, radio is a great background for promos because uh, a lot of it is is timing um, and. It just the skill set. Um, it just trades off nicely. So yeah, we you know we still fantasize because there's no reality in it, you know. But the way that I do keep in radio is I have about uh, forty radio stations that I image uh, in U.S. and Canada, and so I'm interacting with program directors, uh, on-air talent, um, all the time, especially with social media. I follow, uh, all of my radio stations, uh, on Instagram and sure. the on-air people are always, you know, uh, communicating with me and saying, God, Joe, I love it when you say my name at the top of the hour and da 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 da. It's very cool. So that way, Trey, I do get to still have a little, a little radio in me. I have been meaning to ask you, um, I remember growing up and it just popped in my head and I didn't know you then, but now listening uh, to your voice, did you ever do any imaging in Miami for a station called Y100? I didn't do Y100. I did Hot 97, I think it was, or Hot something. And do you know who the disc jockey was there? Uh, Who's that? Zurich or Rick, oh yeah Rick Rick, 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 <laughs> yeah, Rick yeah that's right and that's how I first met Rick uh because that was one of my first I would say early on that, that was probably like early 90s and mm -hmm. um yeah Rick was doing afternoons there and I went to M Miami with Ann my wife Ann uh her parents were uh they had a place in Pompano and okay since I was doing the radio station, I, I said, Hey, I'm going to be in town. Can I, get in? and that's where I got to, got to meet Rick and, and have known him for, for years and years, you know? Nice. Did yeah. you ever cross paths with, with Randy while she was doing radio there? Uh, Randy no, Jones? nope. I did not. Uh, I didn't really meet Randy until we were doing, you know, I was doing promos. We never really met in radio. It was later yes. in voiceover. And oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and she was, was when I was doing Fox, uh, we were on the yeah. media lot uh, on Sunset Boulevard and when Wilton and she was a disc jockey on the wave. We were actually on, in the same building complex. Uh, oh, she was cool. doing radio and I was doing VO for um, for Fox, you know, the voice of uh, all their comedies. And that had to be like around 88, 89, somewhere around there. That's a good segue because um, having having read the book and, and listened to the the audio version, you know, a lot of people and this is why I like having these interviews where uh, folks get to um, hear about the before. Mm -hmm. uh, so radio's doing good for you. And now you make the transition from the burbs in Connecticut to Chocolate City in DC. Um, where does that take you from there? Well, I, I going back to Connecticut uh, and, and because I love broadcast, um, LA was always the destination. I need to get to Los Angeles. Later, it got to be the destination because, well, that's where they do promos, you know. And mm -hmm. I had become aware in Washington DC of these big network voices, Ernie Anderson and Danny Dark and all the voices in it at that time, all men, you know, and, um, thank God that's changed. And, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so that was always the, the, the destination, uh, for me. And, uh, but I was not going to come out here and be a starving actor, another starving actor. So radio was my partner. Radio, uh, supported me throughout my entire, um, kind of, uh, you know, evolution into turning into, into voiceover. So to get to LA, I had to get a radio job. And, um, so I just kept sending out tapes and, you know, Anne is a broadcast person as well. So it would be good for her 
we would be in the number two market in the country. And it did turn out extremely well for her. Yeah. She I had, was at ABC, right? It was at ABC. I took a pay yeah. cut to go from DC wow. to LA because they tell you uh, in LA, they pay you in sunshine uh, when you're in radio. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But for Anne, who got hired as a news writer, first at, at CBS and then at, at KABC, uh, she was an East Coast educated college girl um, journalism major in LA, which her stock like just went through the roof. So she did very well. While I got a pay cut, she got a, a huge raise. She so, got a boost, huh? Yeah. Yeah. She did. yeah. <laughs> That's cool. How did you two meet? Because, you know, one of the things that I uh, love nowadays seeing um, you guys uh, stuff on <laughs> on the various socials um, is that your your grandparents. But before we get there, let's wind the clock back. How did you uh, snag that blonde bombshell, sir? <laughs> at NBC at WKYS. Uh, oh, in DC. Yeah, okay. I was. Uh, I did middays on the FM, and it was 1976, and we had board ops. Uh, so it was the big time, by the way. The other thing I, I, I didn't mention, coming from a small market in Connecticut, going to D.C., I had to then join AFTRA. And so I was a, a union person starting in 1975. And at that time, uh, when I was you know, signing the papers, it was like next to nothing to join. And they said, yeah, by the way, do you want to join SAG too? It's an extra hundred bucks, you know, or something like that. And I said, OK, uh -huh. yeah, I'll get I'll I'll do that. You know, sure. So uh, Anne's uh, first day at the AM, which was an all news station, she was hired to be in the news, one of the news writers and, mm -hmm. uh, um, and a segment producer. Uh, I bumped into her in the hall. She was looking for the news director's office. She literally had just walked in the building. So wow. she, she, didn't, uh, she didn't get very far without me finding her. I found her <laughs> seconds uh, you know, from her walking in the front door. And... Uh, tried to get her to date me for the longest time and she, there was always something it's always something but then finally Isn't it always yes I, I broke her down <laughs> and we got married in 1979 in, in washington dc and oh, then okay. moved out to here to la at the end of 1980 yeah that is pretty cool. Yeah. He broke her down, he said. We'll have to get <laughs> Anne's side of the story on yeah, that. Exactly. Like, right. Yeah. <clears throat> I thought she was going to be so impressed. Uh, hi, I'm Joe Cipriato. I work at Game. And she was like, uh, she had no idea who that guy was. <laughs> what was that? Um, so what was that like, you know, as a couple who are both uh, pretty much in the business, how were you guys able to before work-life balance became a thing, but how were you able to do that? Um, yeah. Being in the business. It was, it, it, the time shifting was, was weird at the beginning because I did, like I said, middays, which is 10 AM to 2 PM. And, and when Ann took the job at WRC, the news director said, uh, well, what do you think of working nine to five? And Ann said, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll do nine to five, but it was 9 PM. Uh, to 5 a.m. Oh, was her first shift. Boy. So she wrote the news all night long <laughs> for the all night anchors. And um, so, yeah, I would come in at 10 and, uh, you know, she she's gone. So we would never see each other at work uh, until finally she got moved to a, a daytime job. And uh, and then when she moved to TV, she was doing nights and I was doing afternoons. And by then we were married in here in LA. And so, you know, I, I would work until 9 p.m. I'm sorry, the first, uh, I did afternoons later. I would work uh, 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. and was working until the 11 o'clock news. So I would go over to KBC and get to hang with her a little bit, you know, while oh, that's she cool. Yeah. And then we would drive home together, you know, yeah. But yeah, it was, uh, the, the good thing about it, Trey, is that we were both in broadcasting. We both understood the hours of broadcasting, the weird stuff. And it also helped when I got into doing promos and we have a plan. We're, we're going out to dinner and, you know, it's seven o'clock 
and we're all dressed and ready to go. And then my agent calls and says, you know, Fox or CBS or whoever, they want you in 15 minutes. And Ugh. now that would put a strain on a relationship, a marriage. But Anne, oh, yeah. she's she came from that. She knows about that. And she was like, okay, okay, I'll, you know, I'll just grab my book and, you know, I'll read while, while you do your session. And then instead of leaving at seven, we leave at 735, you know, go out to dinner. Sure. Yeah. So it was huge to be able to have that shared background. And, and, and we have such a shared background that goes back 46 years. It's, it's kind of like that joke where there's a, a, um, a joke book that has been read by these people over mm -hmm. and over and over again. So much so they know the book so well, they don't even have to say the joke anymore. They just say page 42 and then they both start laughing. And they like, I get it. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's that's when you know you're you're literally uh, here with each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's get into the meat and potatoes. So you both are in LA thriving. Um Let's talk about when it happened, because mm -hmm. I know folks are like, all right, when are they, they going to talk about VO? So there's radio stuff. Yeah, We're really. getting there, kids. We got to set it up. It's called the tease for a reason. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, let's talk about the incident. The incident, kids, get the book and you'll know. But um, let's talk about that, that drive in yeah. where certain guys listening to you on the yeah, radio and yeah then and you know another... uh, because you brought that up uh sure. the, the fact that there's a there's a before that happens i mean i mentioned that i did my first network promo 1982 but yeah. you know there was not a I, I would do a little bit here and a little bit there but i still had radio and there were a lot of disappointments, a lot of big voiceover jobs that I thought I was going to get. I was up for a, the um, uh, midnight, the midnight special, the TV show. I don't know if you even remember it. It goes way back. It was coming back into syndication, and they needed to replace the voice in the show, do the in show, in show announcer. Mm -hmm. And um, I was right up there. Um, and so was a friend of mine who worked at the radio station as well. We sounded so much alike. It was going to be like a $30,000 job. And I was wow. making $30,000 a year. Uh, so at, that one at, job, at, though. That one job was going to be 30000 And That's I cool. really thought, they said, you're, you're in it. You are, you, you know, we're going to make our decision. And it went to my friend and it's, it was kind of devastating because you, 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 you hope that it's going to happen. You dream that it's going to happen. And this is what's going to turn on my voiceover career, change it all. And, but you know what? It doesn't happen like that. Uh, and I, I never, the thing is, I never not believed that I was going to achieve something good. Something good was going to happen. I believed mm -hmm. it with my entire heart. And even uh, getting fired in radio in LA, and it's like, ugh, well, now what do we do? Thank God Ann's working. She's, you know, a KABC or whatever. I just, uh, I had offers to go out of town. And I was not going to take, I was not going to go out of town just to take a job. I was here. Yeah. I was in it to win it. I always believed that I would. Uh, never doubted it for a second, despite reality. <laughs> you know, there was no, I was not making it, you know. Yeah. But um, so you have to go through that. And you and I have talked about that in the past. You got to have those disappointments, those huge failures, so that you can really appreciate the successes that hopefully come your way. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I still stuck in radio. I still pursued, I had, uh, good agents, you know, I'd get jobs and I'd go, wow, this is, this is good. And it would be a one-off or it would be the intro for a show called the, um, Scarecrow and Mrs. King, which was, I, I think, recall that. Yeah. And I used mm -hmm. to do that, you know, like last week on the Scarecrow and Mrs. Qu uh, Mrs. King, you know, you, you do the setup type thing. 
And, and yeah. that was, okay, that's going to lead me to getting to do more promos. And it didn't. And mm. so, and um, I, the story you're talking about is I was on the air uh, at Kiss FM, which is the number one radio station in LA. I was part-time, you know, but I was cobbling together a full-time life by doing uh, production, uh, you know, three days a week, uh, radio shows three days a week. And you, you put that all together and it was a union job. So I was getting union scale, you know, for the work, sure. whether I was doing production or not. And I, I would fill in for jocks. They'd be sick. I'd go, I do their shift. Uh, they'd go on vacation. I do their shift for, you know, a week or two weeks. And I happened to be on the air in the afternoon on the number one radio station in Los Angeles, Kiss FM. Rick Dees was our morning guy. And uh, there was this guy who was stuck in traffic on the 405 heading to Simi Valley. He had just left his job in Hollywood um, at Sunset and Wilton, which is that um, complex I mentioned earlier. Yes, He was the head of marketing for this brand new network called Fox. They had br brought him over. Barry Diller stole him and his uh, uh, business partner, Lou, um, to be the head of promos for this new network. And he's driving home. He's in traffic. It's going to be an hour drive. Um, he's, you know, going over in his head. How are we going to make this network stand out from the big three? I mean, it was the network was on UHF stations. You know, it was on these <laughs> yeah. tiny little uh, stations all over the country. And um, so the look had to be different. The the programming uh, that they were um, helping with as well, everybody pitched in, had to be different, had to be cutting edge, not safe. Like CBS at the time was, you know, the blue hair network. It was all you know, <laughs> old, old, yeah. old lady shows, you know. And, and then, and part of that look and the graphics, what are the promos going to look like? The end plates, the colors that we use, there was also the sound. How can we sound different than ABC, NBC, CBS, who are using all those big, deep Ernie Anderson, the love boat, you know, yeah. all these big, big <clears throat> voices and the radio's on in the car. And, um, there I am, you know doing my radio show, having a blast. And he turns up the volume and goes, wow, well, that's, a, that's a voice. Nothing like it on television. That's a voice that's different. This, this could work. And he actually called the radio station on his big brick of a cell phone in <laughs> 1988. And I yes. remember the, the um, receptionist out front buzzing me and going, Hey, uh, Joe, there's this guy who's calling about a promo and a TV promo. And I go, oh, my God, give him, you know, my agent's uh, name, Steve Tisherman at the time. And okay. um, so that guy was was Bob Bibb and his partner was Lou Goldstein. And they headed up uh, marketing for the network and they brought me in and they started me. I did uh, some late night promos, the Joan Rivers show. And then little oh. by little, I started to do more and more. The guy who was doing the comedy promos took a vacation. He took a two-week vacation. And with no, there is no way you can do the work, you know, when you're gone. Not like nowadays. Not, not back then you couldn't. No. And he was adamant that he was going to take this vacation. He came from radio. You got a vacation in radio, you know. Right. And, uh. Over those two weeks, I would get another show and get another show. And then soon I was doing all of the comedies. And it was the first year that Fox, um, it was the first year of Fox, but they had scored the Emmy Awards. They were going to broadcast the Emmy Awards. And they started putting me on all the Emmy promos. And they did a hundred something Emmy promos with multiple tags. It was like ridiculous. It was August of 1988. And I remember every year we used to go to the um, Eastern Shore with Anne's parents and her whole family. And I couldn't go. Um, both my kids, uh, Dana was born in 84 and Alex in 87. So Alex mm -hmm. was only a, less than a year old. And right. um, they were there. And I stayed back because I'm doing these promos. My gosh. And I'm still working in radio while I'm doing this. 
And I remember doing one day, I don't know how many promos it was for the Emmys. And I called her and I said, I just saw the paperwork for what I just did. It was like 60 tags and, and oh. you know, I don't know how many, but 30, 40 promos. I said, I think I just made $40,000 today. And can you imagine? Listen to what he said, kids. <laughs> today. <laughs> not for the week. Not for the month. Right. Not even for the quarter. Yeah. To day. It was, it was surreal. It was impossible. And I remember Anne is just, I don't even think she could fathom it. You know, I mean, it, it, it's got to be wrong. It's gotta be wrong. <laughs> it can't be right. You know, and yeah. really, how could it be right? I mean, it, but that's, you know, that's a lot, a lot also that I, I talk to talent, although it's, it's changed over the years, you know, why you want to be in AFTRA in SAG, because there is, um, you know, a, um, a scale and, yes. you know, there, there's a pension, by the way, I'm getting up there, Trey, uh, that, that pension is right around the corner. That's <laughs> <laughs> why I tell everybody you gotta put, you gotta put money away. You gotta have a 401k, whatever, do it today. Don't miss it. Put money in so that you have it down the line, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. But Absolutely. that was, that was the start. And I became, the voice of the Fox network. And there were ups and downs in, in that too, Trey. I mean, um, Bob and Lou left and, and a new uh, head of marketing came in and was not into me, not very fond. Uh, so when I went from doing all their promos uh, for all the shows to doing one show, uh, they kept me on the Simpson, Simpsons. And I thought, oh, and I had just gotten out of radio. I waited two years to quit my radio job. And two years into it, that happened. And I was like, oh, and thankfully that guy didn't last long. He only lasted a few months. And then a guy by the name of Jeff Kalnan came in from ABC as head of marketing. And he had heard me previously. He Being at ABC, everybody's watching Fox. All the other networks are watching Fox. And he's like, I want, I want Joe back. Put Joe back in, you know, wow. and, and that's how I, I, and then I went back on all that. So there was a short time uh, where I, I kind of was like, uh-oh, this, this is bad. I, I call it the roller coaster that was going down, you know. Absolutely. And I hate roller coasters. Yeah. yeah. So would you say like from, from that point, once, once the ball really got rolling um, with Fox, did you, did you say to yourself, okay, I, I think. You know, you had a few promos in the in the mid 80s, still doing radio. Mm -hmm. You get to a point with Fox where things are really rolling. When did it hit you where it's like, all right, I think uh, I can I can do this like <laughs> full time, full time. Yeah. Uh, well, like I said, I waited almost two years before I gave up my weekend. I was still kept weekends at the radio station just in case. And um, yeah, once, you know. So that was 1988, 1990. I got out of radio. I'm going full time. And throughout the 90s, you know, it, it's amazing. And so I started, to, what happened in 1997 was one of the um, writer producers at Fox who had been elevated to also, um, you know, being a director of, uh, I think, of comedy marketing. Uh, was hired away by Les Moonves at CBS. CBS, and gotcha. that's um, we had a great relationship, and, and that's why I always talk about relationships in, in voiceover and creating and nurturing relationships with the people you work, the people you work for, um, the creative people who are building these promos and putting your voice on them. And he left, went to CBS, and he called me a few weeks later and said, I keep, we're looking, you know, they're going to change everything. They were, CBS was going to go through a Fox change. They were going to young it up. They were going to get the programming more cutting edge, get rid of the blue haired lady <laughs> shows. And that's what Les Moonves wanted. And he said, you know, I, I, we keep, we're looking for new voices for the network. And whenever 
I put a tape in, I I hope, I wish it, it's going to be somebody that has that sparkle that you have, you know, or or sounds like you or something, but it's not happening. I'm disappointed over and over and over again. And he said, I realized today, why don't I just hire you? There and you go. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I like that thinking. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, so he said, I want you to be the voice of all of our comedies. And I thought, you know, he had left Fox and Bob, Bob and Lou weren't there anymore. Uh, Jeff Calnan was gone. I mean, I had relationships with the people there, but it wasn't as strong. And I thought, well, you know, who knows how long I'm going to last at Fox. And the, the, the head of operations um, called Rita Venari and said, hey, you can't do, he can't do promos for CBS. And Rita said, yes, he can. And she's, he goes, no, he's our voice. And she goes, do you want to put him on a contract? Do you, do you want to have an exclusive with him? We can work oh, that. Boy, and, here and, we go. and he goes, well, you know, and then he starts pedaling backwards, you know, well, <laughs> of course. So from that time, 97 up until like around 2000 and beyond, um, I'm doing both networks. I'm the wow. comedy voice of Fox and the comedy voice of CBS. That's where your question comes in. Did you ever start to think, I could do this for a while, you know? And when I yeah. started to think that and then stopped looking for new jobs and stopped trying to stretch and go into different genres and, and do game shows and do in show, I thought, I'm just going to be this promo guy on two networks and it's going to be okay. And that's when that thinking put me on that next roller coaster down. <laughs> oh boy. Series of events and I suddenly I lose CBS. And and that was like around 2005 or something like that. So I had been doing both networks. So now more than half of my income is gone because I wasn't generating new income. I wasn't going out and and looking for opportunities. I was just kicking yeah. back, you know? I started to like cigars and we'd go out and <laughs> This is, this is cool. This is the life. This will go on forever. No. That's when you start having those spot and tag dinners, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So uh, what happened? So what happened then? You know, like you said, for every roller coaster that goes up, there's that down. Yeah. What happened during the down again? I, and, and then what caused the trajectory to go back up? Yeah. That, you know, and again, it's the same feeling as like, you know, when you lose, lose a radio job and, and all of a sudden they don't want you there anymore. You're not going and parking in their parking lot anymore. You don't work there. And oh, by the way, you don't get that money anymore. You know? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, thankfully I had Fox and, um, but by then there, they, the, the whole do everything that, that whole model started to change. So there were now three, voices doing the comedies and i still had maybe about four shows but i i didn't have every show every night yeah so um i had to okay what am i going to do I, I i you know what's the quick fix on this i i don't know if there is a quick fix but i, I knew one thing i was never going to think that way again that <laughs> this is i could do this for the rest of my life you know <laughs> i don't need to look for new work so okay lesson learned never that'll never happen again um a friend of mine george deloyo who was one of the voices um also yeah. doing comedies at fox um said uh, we were at a our friend brett Wynn, uh who um uh was a writer producer um had a movie that came out um and uh that that um they had a premiere for and I was there at the premiere with George and he just offhandedly said, said, Hey, did you do that audition for the NBC gig? And I was like, what NBC gig? No. He goes, yeah, they're looking for a drama voice. I went, Oh, and I thought, Oh, okay. And, um, but what happened was Don LaFontaine had said to me after I lost the job, he said, listen, Joey, you're, you're, you're too good not to work. Don't worry about it. Keep your nose to the grindstone. And by the way, we're sitting here, we're, we're in his hotel room in, in New York. We were in New York for Joan Baker's launch of her book. 
um, oh, okay. Secrets of Voice of Success. Of success. Yeah. Yes. And he said, the voice that you're speaking in right now is nowhere near the, what you do for comedies. He said, you have to explore all of your voices. And this voice could do drama, could do a number of different things. And then when George said they're looking for a drama voice, I thought, okay, Don gave me that advice. There's an opportunity. I went in and I, I made, I cobbled together again uh, a demo uh, with me doing dramas. And I just pulled scripts and, uh, you know, and, and whatever the current songs were at the time, I, I used that music in, in the background. And I produced some promos, some spots, and I made a demo, like about a minute, minute and a half. Yeah. It's called Rita Benari. And I said, hey, I, I want to be up for that NBC uh, drama gig. And she actually laughed. <laughs> she goes, Joe, you do comedies. I go, yeah, but... I put a, a demo together. I'm going to send it to you. And she called me and she went, that's you. And I said, yeah. And she goes, oh my God, it's, it's amazing. I would never in a million years think that that was you. Yes. Well, I'm submitting it to NBC today. And, yes, um, we just so happened and me, Dana, my daughter, Alex, um, we're going on a trip to Italy. And I'm like, I'm taking this trip. I just lost, you know, more than half of my income. I can't afford this trip. This is ridiculous. But we, you know, it was all booked. And, and so we did it. And while I was in Italy, I got an email from Rita. She no. forwarded a, an email from uh, the um, head of pro promos at NBC. And, and it said, hey, Rita, thanks for the demos. So she included other demos. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> She's, uh, he said, uh, we really like Joe and, uh, we're going to start using him. And I uh, was like, oh my God. And guess what? The, because they were in the drama world, they really didn't even know that I was doing comedy at the other networks. And they yeah. just heard this voice that they hadn't heard before and said, this could work for our dramas, you know? And Suddenly, I'm now I'm doing Fox comedies, and instead of Fox uh, CBS comedies, I'm doing Fox comedies and NBC dramas, you know. And wow. uh, so that was we're back up again, but I'm never gonna, so that, yeah, I'm never gonna do yeah, that. I was gonna, I was gonna say, yeah, that you know, I um, I have that same issue because a lot of the promos that I do, they they hear this and that's what they want. Um, every now and then I will get spots that I can be comedic. Mm -hmm. And when people hear it, they're like, I didn't know you could do that. I'm Damn, like, Damn, I didn't know you did that. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I just need the opportunities. Exactly. And, exactly. You know, I think for a lot of folks that are coming into this industry, they think that because they have a voice like mine, that they're going to automatically you know, jobs are going to fall from the heavens. The velvet ropes are going to fall. <laughs> and, you know, I've had um, folks who have come to me who have a voice like yours. And he's like, well, do you think a guy like me could get work? I'm like, you don't know Joe Cipriano. <laughs> so go to this website, click, 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 and listen to this guy. He's been doing uh, work longer than you've been born. <laughs> so to answer your question, can you do it with and 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 talk a bit about that because because you have and even just talking to you as two friends talking, you're you're always you have this energy about yourself. Mm. Talk about when now you you're you're doing spots where it's not the tonight an all new so and so. Now you're like NBC Thursday. Yeah. Like yeah. Talk about the, 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 the contrast and the difference between doing, uh, having that energy for, for comedy promo. And now you kind of have to bring it, turn that dial from 12 to maybe a, a three or a two. Right. Uh, right. Talk, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I was struggling with, uh, you know, going to Fox, doing high energy comedies and then driving to Burbank, uh, into NBC and now I'm going to do dramas. And it, so that would have to be a, a switch. And so I, I actually 
talk to Maurice Tobias about it. Uh, Love her. Yes. And, um, you know, I've, I have t- <clears throat> taken um, coaching with Maurice, you know, a number of times. And um, I still, uh, you know, I, I coach with uh, Dave Walsh. I'd like to do sessions with Dave because I always like to get a different perspective. And, you know, you're never done learning. Um, you have to keep oh, of course not. moving yeah. forward. And Maurice had a great idea. She said, what do you dress? What do you dress in when you go to Fox? And I go, oh, you know, like a polo shirt like this, you know, uh, maybe shorts, may, you know, maybe jeans or whatever. And she says, OK. And then you go to NBC. I said, yeah. She said, OK, stop at home and uh, on the way, which it was right on the way um, and dress in all black and mm. Always do that before you go to NBC when you're going to do these deep, dark dramas and murder mysteries and all of this complete change, you know, in, in, in style and all of that. And that'll be a visual cue for you when you're in the booth and you're in, all in black that now you're, you're drama, Joe. OK, you're happy, Joe, over at Fox, you know, but when you when you sit in there and you're you're all in black, that's your visual cue. And it worked. Wow. It was good. You know, it I'm really sure, did work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. All right. So now let's, uh, enough of the VO stuff. That's cool and all. Um, <laughs> I, I like to, I like to, 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 um, you know, when I do these shows, I, I have certain segments in mind. You know, we, we've talked about the before and, um, you know, we, we've talked about the, the, the after what happens when you when you keep at something kids <laughs> you're gonna have this but yeah if you're good enough it's you'll not, have more of these than these it's not often always yeah. this yeah. yeah yeah it's not often always that yeah so now a- approaching um you know 30 plus years 40 plus years 40 yeah of, of, of doing this yeah um you know i'm asked <laughs> this question and i would love to get your take do you still get that when you when you get something is this it does it is it still in here oh yes oh my god and that's what doing something that you love uh it's an amazing thing and uh, you know i i feel bad for you know, for people that end up in a job where they just don't really love doing it. You know, that happened to my son for a while. He just didn't love what he was doing. And he he was a writer and he wanted to write. And then suddenly social media came around and the, you need writers in social media. Now he's got this amazing career where he heads up, you know, um, this social uh, division of an ad agency. And he is doing everything creatively that he's ever wanted to do. And, 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 and you know what, that changes your perspective on life and, 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 and everything. And, and it makes everything great. And oh, yeah. I've always had that in, in doing this. I loved radio. Um, I don't think that, like I said, I always thought something good was going to happen. It's going to be, and, you know, in voiceover somewhere and I, I desperately wanted promos and then to get to do it and then do it at a high level, you know, and, and have that come back to you and, and where people say, Hey, you're good. You know, I mean, that, yeah. that's, that's amazing, but it's the, and it's why I, I have learned how to teach promos and I always shied away from it, but I, 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 I want, if somebody wants to do it, I've got a lot of knowledge. I mean, I, I've done this for a long time and I like to be available to people so that they can ask me questions, you know, and tell stories and, and whatever. So being able now at this time, 40 years later, I, I get into this booth and I'm doing a, pro, whatever the promo's for, it could be for a, a streamer or it could be for a cable or HGTV, Discovery Plus, NBC, you know, whatever it is, I get such a charge out of it. And I I love it. I love it. So, yeah, I guess the answer to your question is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talk more about, I know that as of, of late, you've been doing a lot more uh, uh, coaching and and, mm. and, and teaching. Um, 
talk to, to folks who are watching this or listening to this, um, if they're listening to the, the audio version, um, talk to them more about how they can, you know, reach out to you and, and, and the classes sure. and things that you're offering as of, as of late. Yeah. I'm, I, I kind of said that I, I, I didn't listen. I've always had Trey, no problem with confidence, uh, and confidence is everything. And I, and you're a very confident person. Even when I first met you, when you really wanted to get into this business, I knew you had the confidence in yourself that you were going to do it. I mean, it was just obvious. So having confidence is, is a big thing. I did not have confidence in trying to teach people. And I was being asked all the time, you know, hey, do you do coaching? And, and I just didn't feel like I mean, I do what I do. I look at a script and I and it's I know immediately when I look at the script what needs to be done. It's hard. It was hard for me to tell somebody what I'm doing, what my process was. So I didn't have a lot of confidence in it. And I was I finally for years and yet I still was coaching, you know, but trying to stay away from it, you know, because I kind of felt like. Uh, gee, I just don't think I'm I'm giving enough, you know, to these these people that are are coming to me and 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 saying, hey, you, what can you teach me? You know, I just didn't yeah. feel I was doing it, and I got tired of that. I got because I like being confident, and I have it in every, <laughs> in a lot of things. You know, I don't have it in everything, but in a lot of things. And it was uh, January first, twenty twenty three. I follow uh, the Rock, Dwayne Johnson, on uh, Instagram. Yeah. That morning we were at friend's house in, in Orlando, Florida. We had done new year's Eve, woke up in the morning. It's going through, you know, and there's the rock. It's, it's new year's morning. He's walking wherever he was. And he started to tell a story. He said, this is a good day to talk about this. January one. He said, you've got goals, right? We all have goals and you, you may have a number of them and you have to, at one time, try to set some priorities. So you look at your goals and you look at this one. Is that one day or is it day one? I am mm. going at it now. And it was, it hit me. Like I was so energized. I, I remember Anne came back into the room and I go, oh my gosh, you won't believe. And I told her th that story. And I just grabbed on day one. Uh, this is day one. Damn it. I am not going to be shy, fearful of, of teaching. I have got to do something about this. And over the course of next several months, I developed a curriculum. Uh, I planned out how I would do a promo class, how it should be properly done. I started to dissect promos and talk about different styles. And my daughter-in-law, married to my son, who I was just talking about, is a, a designer, social media uh, designer, and a, a great artist. She found this platform for teaching online, and she started digging in there and we we decided on colors and br what the brand is going to be. And she started to design this entire, um, the look of what the course would, would be like. It's a, it's a flip book course and it's highly interactive. It's audio and video and people upload the reads. I get a notification. I come in, watch the read or hear the read do a video back to them. We are constantly communicating back and forth. When somebody does my intro class, which could go two weeks to three weeks, uh, cause you're doing it at, at your own pace. We're working yeah. on uh, close to 10 scripts in that one. Um, they've got me for that amount of time. They can ask me anything they want. They're getting direction from me all the time. The master class has over 20 scripts and that can go on for four weeks. It just depends on, on, on the pace that, you know, the talent and how my schedule is. But I, I've learned now since we, it took, took me from January 1, we launched the online uh, mid-November. So that's how long mm -hmm. it took to develop it. 
and That's so it's been going cool. since yeah it's been going since november and uh, it's one of the things that i love now and i look forward to it i'm looking at my email right here i have just a few uh, notifications that just came in from uh students that are in the class i have multiple classes going on at the same time there's the intro class and the master class and i have right now four master classes with multiple students in each of those classes and i have mm -hmm. about eight of the intro classes so it's it gets to be busy but i put it in my day just like i do i do radio imaging in the morning uh i do you know cables and streamers midday you know networks are after one two so i and then you know, okay, maybe from four to five, I'm going to do, um, you know, the master class or the intros yeah. and, and, and do all of that. So, yeah. So I, I do have that. I, I think I wrote to Dwayne Johnson to thank him, uh, for the inspiration. He'll never see it, but it felt good that I was able to, to thank him, uh, for it because it kind of, in a certain way, um, enriched my life, changed my life in, in a little bit, because now I enjoy doing it. I'm, I'm not afraid to do it and, and I'm having a good time doing it. So yeah. now Trey, I'm getting to, I do promos. I, I, and I, and I do radio imaging and I do in show and I do game shows and I get to do this. I get to share, you know, my experience and, and try to give some, something to, to talent that want to do what you and I do, you know, doing yeah. promos. So thanks for asking about that. Uh, no problem. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do love. I do love doing it. So, speaking of life changing, we're getting to uh, about to wrap things up. This is the part of the show. So, the show is called "Take Time Out" with Trey Mosley. So, um, I now get to ask the great Joe Cipriano. <laughs> I know part of it already because, like I said, we we follow each other on the socials. Um, how does Joe take time out for himself? I know part of that is being Pawpaw because <laughs> you love them grandbabies. Oh boy. But uh, yeah. talk about, you know, when, when, when the mics are off mm -hmm. and uh, you're out of the booth, how do you take time out for yourself, man? Oh, well, thank you for that, Trey. That's, uh, you know what? It's funny how things happen um, and technology progresses. So, so now we can do what we do from wherever we are. So yeah. we have a place, our place here that I'm in, in Los Angeles. And we also have a place in West Palm Beach, Florida, where my daughter and her family are and our grandkids. My son and his wife are here in, in LA. So we bounce back and forth and we have such a wonderful balanced life and are able to be in our grandkids' lives. My best friend happens to live in West Palm Beach. So when I'm there, I've got the best of everything uh, there and I've got the best of everything here as well. So Anne and I now, you know, we're getting, we're getting up there and, uh, <laughs> but we, we travel a lot. Uh, we're going to, Fr we're taking the whole family to France this, um, nice. this summer. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's that it's traveling. It's being in uh, my family's lives uh, full time. And because of, you know, there, there's, there's your studio, you know? Oh, <laughs> right. By the way, there, there's my grandkids. Oh, there they go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we can, I can still work and, and I can compartmentalize that and the work gets done here. You know, Papa does work here when the kids are at school or, or you know, during the day here in LA and we get together with Alex and Sarah and we get together with our friends. So it's, it's a really nice balanced life that I didn't used to have through the nineties and two thousands because I'm doing two networks, three networks full time. And, you know, sure. ISDN came in, you know, mid nineties and we, that helped, but it, it's like, you thank God I didn't have grandchildren then you know, because yeah, I wouldn't be able to have the time to do it. Mm -hmm. So um, I, another, you know how I said, I always thought good things were going to happen. I always believed that good things were ha going to happen. I always had a yeah. positive attitude. And guess what? It's, it's happened again in that um, 
we're, we're in a time now where I can do the best of both. You know, I can work and I can also be um, in our family's lives and in our friends, you know, and travel. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing, Trey. I am traveling. <laughs> <laughs> and he has a pretty mean backhand from what I have. Ah, I love my backhand. It's a two handed. Uh, and um, and I'm uh, and golf as well. My best friend, John, uh, in West Palm Beach is a former professional tennis player. Number 20 in the world. And nice. number one in Great Britain. And uh, so we play, we play tennis. He plays down at my level and, and the <laughs> rest of the people that play with him. And uh, at golf, we're even. So that's always oh, okay. fun. Yeah. Um, so we do, do a lot of that. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. <laughs> that's good. I'm a man. lucky guy. Um, I'm a lucky you, boy. Hey, you know, Call me I, I, uh, you, you got a pretty good life over there, sir. And um, for a, for a career that has spanned forty plus years and still going strong, um, you, I'll tell you a story, and and then we can end it. Um, I always talk about our relationship, mm -hmm. but I don't think I've ever told it to you directly. And if I haven't, then shame on me. Um, hmm. Around 2013 or 14, um, we met. And I, I use the word met vaguely because we were only Facebook friends. And I remember there was an app back in the day called Periscope. <laughs> yes. And you used to always go live in your sessions. I think you were doing Queen Latifah then. Oh, yeah. And I thought it was always cool because you'd have a stopwatch around your neck. And I'm like, there is no way this guy is going to do this there it is. in 30. <laughs> See, he always had the stopwatch. Always, and he would, always nearby. Yeah. He, you would go into it and you would stop. And he's like 29.6. <laughs> do another one, like 29.8. I'm like, how is he doing this? Yeah. And I was always so amazed by that. And then um, we finally met my first time in L.A. I met you and I think you signed my secrets of voiceover success book that i still have wow um and <clears throat> fast forward to about 2016 in my vo career actually 2017 and my vo career wasn't where i thought it was going to be and i had just reconnected with danielle mm -hmm. we were because we had dated years before and i didn't get my act together that's not a story anyway <laughs> we, so we get back together and i'm like I'm, I'm done with this VO thing. You know, I've given it uh, so many years of my life thinking that this was going to be where I wanted to be. And I felt I was good. I just didn't think that I was getting the opportunities. Not getting the breaks. Yeah. Yeah. And she said, well, look, VO Atlanta's coming up again. I'm like, I don't want to go. She said, no, hear me out. Let's go. <laughs> you know, it'll give you a chance to be around your tribe, so to speak. And if you don't feel nothing while you're there, we'll figure out a plan B. Mm -hmm. um, I go have a great time. Um, I get to see you, Dave, and, and all of my other, you know, mentors doing doing what you guys do. And then at the end of the conference, as you know, VO Atlanta has these crazy raffles. That's a whole bunch of one upsmanship. Well, you gave that away. I'm going to give this away. And I never win. I never won. But something told me, all right, maybe this will be the year. <laughs> and I win a raffle. And it was a one hour consultation with that young man right there. <laughs> and Denise wow. emailed me. Wow. And set up a time so that you and I could, could chat. And for that hour, I, I know I must have thrown everything at you, but <laughs> you answered all of my questions and you listened to my stuff. And it's something you said that always stuck with me. Two things, actually. And he was like, Trey, buddy, you got something, but these promos don't serve you justice. And I didn't understand what that meant at first. And you said, I hear a lot of SOT. I hear a lot of production, but I don't hear you. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I was sitting there thinking, okay, so this is 1500 bucks. I just wasted. <laughs> and, but you told me, he's like, no, it, it, you, if you, if you send these directly to production houses, 
you may get work. But he's like, but if you want to compete with me and other folks, most agents aren't going to listen to this demo. So I'm like, uh, all right. And you told me, always read the trades. And to yeah. this day, I have a subscription to Variety mm -hmm. and a couple of other things because you said there's work in the trades if you know how to look. I still, uh, every morning, I still read. Yep. See? Yeah. So, and you said, give yourself... He's like, is this 2017? So I'll, I'll give you a year. If you do everything I, I, I'm telling you now in a year, you'll see a change. Wow. And I'm like, okay, uh, if anybody's going to set me straight, it's got to be this guy. <laughs> so I did everything you said. Um, I started to incorporate more of myself and my reads. I made sure that the, my demos that I had produced uh, had more of me versus the sound. Mm -hmm. And um, I joined Atlas that year. Oh, wow. And um, from from that day on, it, it took me a while to kind of latch on to where Atlas could trust me and I could trust them. But from 2018 to 2020 is when realistically things took off for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to say publicly and to everyone who's watching, Thank you. Uh, you know what? I, I That's such a great story. I, I love it. But there's also part of that is, you know, as much as I said, I, I struggled with, with teaching people, having a conversation with someone and looking at what they're doing and I'm able to see, okay, I see what they're, what they're doing wrong or what they, not necessarily wrong, but what they want to need to do differently. And, but with you, it was always from, from the moment that I would hear your stuff, I knew, just like I always said that I knew I was, something good was going to happen. I knew, I knew it. And I knew that that was going to be for you as well. There are certain things that you can hear in people um, when, when they come to you and, and ask for advice and things like that. And, and sometimes you go, oh, you know, I, I, I'll give them everything I can, but I just, I just don't feel it. You know, uh, you have to be in a position of, you have to have talent. You have to have an understanding of yourself, um, believe in yourself so that when I can say a couple of little things to you, that you take them in and you implement them and you have the talent to implement them and then make it so much better than, than my little suggestions. So I give it right back to you, you know, it doesn't happen that way with everyone. Um, you have to have the willingness, the talent and, and the ability, and you got all that. Well, I thank you, sir, you. for, for seeing that in me. And I, I hope I do you proud. You done. Um, you don't have to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I appreciate that. You know, I do my best to, and you're a big proponent of, of paying things forward. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, do my best to pay things forward with my time, um, my philanthropy. I've, I've had students that I've coached that maybe didn't have the, the best equipment. I may have had some stuff around here. I'm like, look, it's a few years old, but it's better than what you got. Right. I can send this to you and, and, you know, That's it'll, awesome. it'll help your sound out and stuff. So, um, matter of fact, uh, there was a guy named Lee Penny. Oh, Lee Penny. Sure. Yeah, I know. Lee. So Lee gave me my first 416. Wow. Game. Wow. And I remember the conversation and I was like, I don't care if it's dented and been hit by a truck. If it works, I'll take it. <laughs> and, and he pinged me and said, Are, were you serious about what you said? Because I think we were in a chat or something. I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, give me your address. And he wow. screenshot me a picture of his 416. And I'm like, are you? Because at that time I just had a. I had a shotgun mic, but it was not a 416, but it, it did, it did. Okay. It did the job. Yeah. And in about two days I got it. And I, I kept that from 2017 up until, uh, a few weeks ago where a friend of mine was moving and they were driving cross country. They were staying at a hotel and they left some of the stuff in the car. They vandalized his car, took a lot of his gear. He had no mic. And I'm thinking, oh my, I got to do something. Wow. So uh, I have now passed that 416 on to him. I love it. 
So Talk about you know, this is this is my new boy. baby here. But I I I I, I pass that on to him. I said she is gonna she is still rocking and rolling after ten plus years because it was ten years amazing old when I got it from Lee. Yeah, and then I had it for five years after that. Yeah. So wow. Um, but what a, so, yeah, a beautiful man. that's a, a a physical paying it forward. That is awesome. And you know what? That person may pass it along at some point as well. You know. Yeah. It, it's wow. So I do my best to uh, do what I do what I can beautiful. in the community because I love it. For me coming up, I didn't really have uh, a a map, so to speak, of how to go through this thing. It wasn't until I met you know, folks like you and, 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 and Dave Fenoy and, and, and others who poured into me, I didn't, I didn't know who to reach out to, but you guys were kind of, um, my cornerstones into building my VO foundation. So, um, how nice. I, I thank that. you again, sir. Yeah, it's an honor. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, I have kept you long enough, man. Um, yeah, I hope that before we go, you can edit this baby down. Oh, you know, <laughs> We'll, 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 we'll make you look good. Um, <laughs> tell folks how they can find you on the socials and, um, oh, yeah. do you have a website for your, for your training? I and, do. Uh, drop I, all that good stuff in. Oh, okay. Sure. Well, you, my website, uh, joecipriano.com. And if you there, you know, up on top, you you would see, um, promo masterclass and you can click on that, or you can also go to promo masterclass.com on, uh, Instagram. I'm Joe Cipriano VO. On uh, X, <laughs> I love that we were just talking about the other day. They still say X, formerly Twitter. It's like, okay, yeah. get over it. I mean, it's X for God's <laughs> sakes, you know. Uh, I'm Joe Sip, J O E C I P, and uh, I, on uh, Facebook, you can just put in my name, you'll you'll find me. It's uh, I think it's Joe. Uh, it's facebookcom slash Vo, something like that. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and and. Uh, you know, the, the promo master classes, the online classes, um, I do a lot of social on that. I, I have some promos that I put out on it. I'm always trying to show what it's like and show how interactive it is and how I these people that uh, I'm working with, we are in each other's lives. Um, you know, Heather Mann Foster, uh, Heather did my very first, this was last summer, I asked her if she would be my beta tester uh, in the master class. And I got to know her and she got to know me so well through those weeks of doing that. And she traveled with me. Anna and I were on a, on a trip. Um, we started here in LA. We went to England for Wimbledon where my buddy John was. I'm doing class, the class with Heather. And she goes, oh, we're in England now. And I go, yeah, you know, and now next we're going to France. And we go to France and I'm t talking to her from where we were staying in France, you know. And uh, she happened to see in the background, uh, my buddy, we were with uh, our friend, Michael Damien, who's um, an oh, actor. Yes. And uh, that's right. And so we were with him and his wife, Janine, and Anne and I spent like a week and a half with them, you know, all over um, France and Cote d'Azur and, and all of that. And she saw in a social that, are you with Michael Damien? I go, yeah. <laughs> she goes, oh my God, I was in love with Michael Damien. I, I grew up watching him, you know, on uh, Y&R. And so yeah. I, I was doing a, a lesson with her and on my on iPhone, I go, okay, Heather. So I want to talk about the read. Oh, but first of all, and Michael's right here, I want you to meet my friend. Michael. Oh, Michael wow. goes, Hi, Heather. It's Michael Damien. You know, you know. Uh. <laughs> she said when she got it, she screamed. She was in her booth. Oh, sure. the door was open. Her husband came running in going, what's the, wh what's wrong? She goes, it's Michael Damien. Michael Damien just said hi to me. <laughs> but she traveled with me taking the class. And then we ended up back in Connecticut. And we went up to Maine to visit my brother and then back down to Florida. It was just funny that <clears throat> and fun that the very first student, Heather, and, and now, you know, we've become very good friends. Yeah. Took that trip with me while she was doing the master class. And, and then she took the in-person master class uh, last September uh, here in Hollywood, which was uh, fun, which was cool. 
but yeah, so uh, it's a it's an interesting. That's what's so cool about this online course. I mean, I, I really feel that I can, that I'm interacting with with the people that are taking the course. It's even better trade than doing in person, because you're doing like I'm going to do three hours right with with a class of twelve. What are you going to get up on mic twice, maybe three times? You know, you got twelve right. people to cycle through, and on this. You do, you're reading 20 scripts, you're doing 20 promos and working mm -hmm. each and every one of them. So I think I have found something that it's like, this works. I, I like it. So I'm happy that, it, that I've found it. And that's that. <laughs> Good for you. And that my friends is how we are going to end the show. I want to thank once again, Sip as we call him, yep. Joe Cipriano for hanging out with me and uh, thank you all for hanging out too and we will catch you next time thank you Trey thanks for listening to the Take Time Out with Trey Mosley podcast part of the Titan Media Network you can find us on Spotify Apple iHeart or wherever you get your podcast to see the video version of this you can find us on YouTube on the Take Time Out with Trey Mosley YouTube page thanks for listening or thanks for watching either way we'll see you next time